ever wondered about how ISO standards can help advance the progress of global, green and low carbon development? This video shares the insights from a presentation at an international conference in China. Let's take a look. Welcome to EMS Mastery, where we look at the successful strategies and tactics to master environmental management and sustainability. If we're meeting for the first time, my name is Andrew Marlow. The presentation was made during a Green Development Conference, where Sheila Leggett, as the chairperson of the ISO Technical Committee, TC207, which is responsible for all standardisation in the field of environmental management to address environmental and climate impacts, including related social and economic aspects in support of sustainable development. She shares her considerable insight into global green and low carbon development, which will help your understanding of the development of ISO standards in this area and the future trends. So over to the presentation by Sheila. Uh, I'm honoured to be here and ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to deliver these awards today at this inspiring conference. Um, our technical committee arrived on week with Bush to have their meeting, and um, I want to take this time to uh, thank CNIS and the non-local government for their uh, tremendous uh, welcome and warm hospitality for our meeting. Uh, this is the first time I've been in the Bush Town area, and I'm impressed by both the vision and the active movement towards green and low carbon development, as well as the excellent beauty of the surroundings. Let's take a minute to talk about the history of the ISO. Um, it's amazing when we look back at some of these international organizations that they've been around for so long and they continue to do such useful and valuable work for all of us globally. So ISO was founded in 1947 by a group of 20 of uh, delegates in 25 countries. The goal then, and it continues to be to this day, is to ensure products and services are safe, reliable, and as good quality. It's a global system, and I just wanted to point out a couple of um, facts for you that there is composed of 162 national measures. And it represents about 98% of the world's gross national income, as well as 97% of the world population. The organizational basis is worked on national standards bodies, um, like the SNC here in China. And they gather together the national stakeholders in order to provide input to the NSB directly to the ISO. And ISO has a series of technical committees of which the one on environmental management is the one we're in the meeting in Bush on this week. If you're getting value out of this episode, please click on the like button. And if you want to see more videos, please subscribe and hit the notification bell to access more videos from this YouTube channel. So today, I feel public more than 22,000 standards. Now, as I've been here for about um, almost a week now, and I've learned the incredible um, dedication and diligence of trying to create standards, this number may not sound as large as I thought it sounded at the time, so I'm thrilled to be here and learn more. The value of international standards is that it's so important that they represent a global consensus. There, there's something that um, national experts come together from all over the world and they arrive at a consensus of what that standard could be and should be. And then that goes forth into the world. So it gives us all an uh, even platform by which they all know they want to operate uh, and do so on a voluntary basis. But by having gone through the process, I think it commits all of us to those standards. Standards are developed not in the back of the room with uh, games behind it or anything like that, but they're developed in principles of openness and transparency and impartiality and consensus. 
And I think it's those principles that have allowed the ISO and continued to play such an important role globally um, through all this time. Three years. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk now about the mm -hmm. two of the event, which is the technical committee that has been meeting this week. One of the subcommittees has been meeting here, as well as the chair's advisory group. It's a family standards that are related to environmental management, and we have 82 mm -hmm. countries participating, as well as 37 observing members. <coughs> The 14,000 managed to act as both an internal management tool and also as a way for um, companies to demonstrate their condition of environment to their customers and their clients. Today, we published 38 international standards, and there are 24 more under development. Our scope is as a standardization of environmental management system and tool in support of sustainable development. We're composed of six committees as well as associated working groups and there are many working groups that um, are uh, under each of those subcommittees. An important piece I'd like to point out is about the structure of the, the subcommittees as well as the chair's advisory group is the appointment of the leadership. So um, the chair and the vice chair will be from either developed or developing country. There is always a way for those two to make sure that we can pursue with the learn from each other. I'd just like to quickly go through the focus of the subcommittees. Um, the first one is environmental management systems, and there are 346,000 certificates in over 200 countries that have been issued in this context. Um, the life cycle assessment subcommittee is the basis for all life cycle assessment studies. The Greenhouse Gas Management Subcommittee provides an internationally agreed framework for measuring PhD emissions. Identifying carbon footprint, verifying claim, and accreditation of body. And this is an example of where China plays an important leadership role. Then it includes the aim of CNRS is the co-secretary of this group. Then it says the Subcommittee on Environmental Labeling. In 44 countries have adopted the general principal standard of that subcommittee as their own national standard. Also, the Environmental Performance Evaluation Subcommittee. And again, it is the standard has been adopted by or intended to be adopted by 29 countries. And then we have the Environmental Auditing Framework, which provides a framework for automating environmental management um, systems. Within the CAG, the Charity Advisory Group, we also have a number of working communities there. And um, that, that's one where one of our working committee, 11 on a finance, was spearheaded completely by China in bringing that important forward. The so main say of the um, 14,000 series is the 14,001 environmental management series standard, which was updated in 2016. It provides guidelines on establishment or the improvement of an environmental management system. As it's not always possible to just start from zero and get to 100% in any given time. It's designed to be integrated with other management functions and systems. For example, we were on the field for a uh, ceramics company yesterday, and they integrate, in addition to 14,001, they integrate 12 other management systems into both their design and process operation. The renewal of the 14,001 standard focuses on the improvement of the environmental performance and environmental management. Another important aspect of the revised standard is, is its focus on life cycle. And another aspect of it is that if another improvement forward is the requirement of risk identification and opportunity and how you need to address them both. So what are the relevance of the 14,000 standards to green and low carbon development? One way I thought to look at it was to look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals. When you look at the subject area that 207 covers, we relate and directly relevant to 14 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Examples are number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure, 11, sustainable cities and communities, 12, responsible consumption and production, 
13, she's fine at accidents. 14, she's like below water. 15, like on land. And 17, like the chips of gold. Uh, just if we take one example of uh, the table development goal 13, find an action. Some of the work that it takes me to a better than involved in that related to this is in the area of environmental management, environmental labels and declarations, quantifying greenhouse gas emissions, and the whole concept of the 14,001 environmental management system. One last point that I just like to do with before I close. Is the use of ISO standards in public policy. This could be a year in my part and some of the things I've done in my previous um, parts of my career. When you have standards that have been developed globally by experts that are renowned in their field and they've come together to work under the principles that I talked about in terms of transparency, um, fairness, uh, being able to develop things like consistency. This allows the ISO standards to be a very important resource in my mind for public policy. Just the process that has been gone through to develop those standards, those standards gives a very high level of legitimacy to meet public interest. And I know in Canada that's something that we're dealing with a lot, and it's something that is very important from my perspective. And one of the reasons I got involved with ISO is to allow that essential legitimacy to be developed. So that we can move forward and continue to um, develop sound public policy. So, just in conclusion, uh, the movement towards green and low carbon development requires global action as well as local action. Uh, and having these types of standards that are internationally strengths and base is a very important way, in my mind, of bringing together experts to provide best knowledge and help chart the path forward. Thank you very much for your time. If this episode has helped to advance your understanding of the use of ISO standards in the field of green and low carbon development, please leave a comment in the box below if this video has helped you. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel to ensure that you don't miss out on other episodes on environmental management and sustainability. Until then, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this video, you can watch other episodes by clicking on the boxes in the top and bottom right, and to subscribe to this channel, click on the link to the left.